Hey Tom, can you hear me? Tom? Hello, this is Tom. Hi Tom, I just want to make sure that you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Are we record are we recording already? Yeah, I uh, was. Uh, I just wanted to see, make sure things were working okay. So, right. Yeah. So we'll wait for our uh, speaker to show up. Right. I I I think you set out the slides. Am I right? Or. Yeah, he did. Uh, but he was. Uh, he did say that he wanted to. Uh, um, you know, run the slides himself. I was just a call back position. So as long we'll we'll confirm that he can share his uh, desktop and then we'll take it from there. Great. I just need the bio that's in the um did you, did you send the bio? Yeah the bio's in the um it's in here. The slide set. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting it. Yeah, I'll go through the uh, speaker's bios right there. Are you you going to introduce the speaker? No, you're introducing the speaker and the uh, today's presentation, right? You're doing the last two slides, nine and ten. Tuya, can you hear me? Hello. Hey, Tom. I. Uh, Tom. Well, I'm not. Huh. For some reason, I don't see him on there. I'm not too sure why. Tom, can you hear us? It looks like when Kata was able to send out the link for everyone, which is good. recorded and broadcast live on Zoom and F Facebook Live. Link to the recorded videos and slides will be made available later. Uh, please call, keep all cameras off and microphones muted to help uh, with the bandwidth issues and background noise. And if you have questions during the presentation, please post the questions in the chat windows to everyone and we'll take breaks period periodically to answer them. Next page. Uh, please be sure that your display name in the Zoom matches the one the user registered. Um, this will make it easier for us to check you in. And if you did not register it and will forward, forward the link to this meeting, uh, please send Jay Benway a chat message in Zoom with your name, email address, and IEEE membership status, whether you are non IEEE, IEEE only, or IEEE and, M and MTT, so that we can register, register and check you in. And last, lastly, uh, please support us by becoming a member. Great. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Give me back to Jay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the agenda for today is uh, we will just do a quick uh, couple of items here. COVID-19 update. Uh, this, is, this is a joint talk, so I'll just go over the, the other societies that are supporting us. And that is the Circuits and Systems Society and the Photonic Society. Um, and then I'll ask Tom to uh, introduce a speaker and then we'll get into the talk itself. 
Um, questions and answers, um, as mentioned by, by, by Tan, if you can, if you have any questions, please use the chat window. That makes it a little bit easier to handle. Um, I think everybody's aware, if not, uh, you may be in a different world, but uh, we're in a COVID-19 pandemic. All our in-person meeting, meetings related to our chapter are canceled and our monthly meetings are, and officer meetings are continued online and virtual. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a sponsored uh, uh, by a couple of other societies, the Circus and System Society and the Phonics Society. Uh, our chapter officers, I'm the, uh, the chair, Jay Banwait, our vice chair, which is Gosh Unikrishna. Uh, he's not on today. Our secretary is Tan Tui, and our treasurer is Tom McKay. Um, we also have our uh, secretary from for next year, uh, Venkata Angada, who is also online as well. So with that, I'll ask uh, Tom to uh, do the introduction for our speaker, Tom. Come on, I'm now unmuted. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jay. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Edward Ackerman, who received his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Lafayette College in 1987. His MS and PhDs uh, degrees in Electrical Engineering from Drexel in 89 and 1994, respectively. From 1989 through 1994, he was employed as a microwave photonics engineer at Martin Marietta's Electronics Laboratory in Syracuse, New York, where he demonstrated the first amplifier-less direct modulation analog optical link with RF gain. From 1995 to 1999, he was a member of the technical staff at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, where he achieved the lowest noise figure ever demonstrated for an amplifier-less analog optical link, um, which was 2.5 dB at 130 megahertz. Since 1999, he has been vice president of R&D for Photonic Systems, Inc. of Belrico, Massachusetts. He has authored more than 80 technical papers and 14 US patents on the subject of analog photonic subsystems performance modeling and optimization. Dr. Ackerman is a fellow of the IEEE. Next slide. So the title of today's talk is Analog Photonics Systems, Features and Techniques to Optimize Performance. Both the scientific and defense communities wish to receive and process information occupying ever wider portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. <clears throat> Excuse me. This can often create an analog to digital conversion bottleneck. Analog photonic channelization, linearization, and frequency conversion systems can be designed to alleviate this bottleneck. Moreover, the low loss and low dispersion of optical fiber and integrated optical waveguides enable most of the components in a broadband sensing or communication system, including all of the analog to digital and digital processing hard hardware, to be situated many feet or even miles from the antennas or other sensors with almost no performance penalty. The anticipated presentation here will highlight the advantages and other features of analog photonic systems, including some specific systems that the author has constructed and tested for the US Department of Defense. And we'll review and explain multiple techniques for optimizing their performance. Okay, Dr. Ackerman. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Um, so I'm going to back, go back to sharing my complete screen and go into slideshow mode here. And let's make sure everyone sees my first very boring uh, title slide. Yeah. Yep. Very good. OK, well, as Tom mentioned, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> analog photonic subsystems. Well, why analog photonics? Um, you know, this is the MTT Society, and so we're all concerned. Uh, we're all microwave people, and I'm a microwave person. Um, uh, it's the MTT Society in which I'm a fellow, not, not the Photonic Society, which is a society. Uh, so why is that? Well, my, I want to do what other microwave engineers want to do. I want to use the spectrum very wisely and uh, very efficiently to communicate or to sense, uh, to, to perform radar functions, all sorts of things like that. 
but sometimes to do that the best way involves photonics in some way and i've become um uh very uh you know familiar with ways to do that and that's what i want to talk to you about and this is a very um this is a field that started right around when i was getting uh, my advanced degrees and so it was exciting then it's remained very exciting the the, the field keeps evolving there's there's new discoveries all the time and there needs to be more we are we we need you know um uh, tom's introduction he mentioned some performance uh milestones that we hit um but you know the, uh, like the low noise figure of two and a half db <laughs> that is at 130 megahertz i achieved that in the late 1990s it still hasn't been uh, we ha we don't have a lower noise figure demonstration yet than that, and not at any higher frequency than that. So lots to do. Um, there's a lot of opportunity, though. There there's less U.S. authorship of papers in the Journal of Light Wave Technology now uh, than there were than there was in the 1990s. So um, we are we have a shortage of light wave engineers. Um, what I would call light wave engineers. Like I said, I'm an RF engineer who knows light waves, and that's good enough. I would I would hire someone with that expertise um uh but so i, I want to tell you what it is that's interesting about photonics basically it's bandwidth and and the properties of optical fiber which are which are just terrific and as you'll see um when do you want to use them basically when you want to move signals um especially when you want to move signals you can do other things with the signals in photonics but especially when you want to move them a long distance because of the great characteristics of fiber these are two uh, uh photos of scenarios where that's the case uh the atacama large middle meter wave array that looks that's looking for radio waves in space uh between the frequencies of 30 gigahertz and a terahertz and um, the, these dishes are very far away from civilization. I'll get to that. Uh, have, I'll return to this slide later. Um, and then this Navy destroyer is just an example. All those white uh, circles at the tops of masts are antennas. And the signals, you want to deal with the signals that they're receiving uh, below deck. And you don't want to have to have all your digitizing equipment up at the antenna where it needs to be maintained and repaired and has to work uh, under uh, tough, tough environmental conditions. So you just want to put at the antenna what can retrieve the signals and bring them below deck. Um, so I'm going to get in, into that as well. Um, especially on this this slide, I'm going to return too many times too. So this shows a very generalized block diagram of what you might need in order to retrieve information off of a off of broadband a broadband set of carriers um illuminating an antenna say at the top of a mast on a ship on a ship let's let's use that example so i'm using color here not to denote color of light but rather uh, uh different frequencies different rf frequencies so the six different colored arrows um i don't know if you'll be able to see my cursor if i'm pointing um are have yeah. Uh, have modulation sidebands in these various channels in this example and i need to get them to these receivers all the way over here on the right um, and i need to get one you know each to its own receiver um, uh, that's going to involve analog to digital conversion right before each receiver it's going to involve down conversion to baseband prior to that um, and prior to that, I'll, I need to channelize that. In other words, send each set of frequencies to its own um, receiver chain here. Um, so those are the obvious functions that everyone knows about. What, what often is not um, talked about uh, is the fact that because spectrum is crowded, and especially as you saw on that ship, some of those antennas are actually transmitting and they're transmitting many watts of power. Meanwhile, this receive antenna is very sensitive. You know, it's set up for receiving, um, you know, uh, nanowatts of power maybe. Uh, so it's going to, these receivers are going to be swamped by anything nearby uh, anywhere in this band, broad bandwidth that's, that are, that's, um, transmitting in the watts or tens of watts. So that's what's called an interfering signal. Obviously, uh, sometimes it's our own cooperative interferer, but we still need to do something about it. And this block, general block shows the need to basically sub uh, do subtraction to suppress the interfering signal so that, um, the, so that I'm not outside my dynamic range so that I can still be sensitive to the receivers I want. Um, 
And that's uh, shown notionally here, to, uh, two different transmit antennas at, at these two example frequencies within the band, much uh, with much stronger carriers than what I'm trying to receive. The other thing I might want to do, uh, the only box I haven't addressed here, is I might want to adjust the amplitude or phase or especially the delay uh, that the signal experiences between the antenna and the receiver so that if I'm also receiving the same signal at other antennas on the same platform, I can do spatial beam forming uh, by delaying one relative to the other, and then they'll add up constructively only if they came from a certain direction. So that's the beam forming. So lots of different things I want to be able to do. As you can guess, I'm going to be talking about ways we might do the, any of these with photonics. Um, the main thing, though, like, like I said, can, can photonics technology play a role? The, the main and obvious way it can is obviously with this thing called uh, doing this role called antenna remoting. It's a, a, a set of words you hear a lot within the photonics community. Um, in the case of the Atacama array, because these antennas are so far away from their operators, you don't want to put you want to put a minimum of electronics equipment at each antenna. When I say distant, I don't know if you know where the Atacama array is. The Atacama plateau in Chile is so high and so dry. There's no evidence, archaeological evidence, that it, that it has ever rained there. Um, so um, they, you know, there's obviously no civilization nearby, in other words. And that's, what, that's the whole point of a radio telescope. You put it where there's no uh, man-made interferers. Um, but that does mean you've got to move the signals very, very far. So they don't want to have to digitize at each at each um, uh, element and then uh, send the signals digitally. You need an analog photonic link to do that from each of these. Um, and on the and on the ship, the same. What I said earlier is true that that you want to bring the analog signals below deck and have all that other equipment that I mentioned on the block diagram be be below deck. Um, so well, why use fiber optic links for that? It's because the optical fiber is so ideally suited for antenna remoting. The, the waveguides are small and light and, um, and they do not affect or nor are they affected by the EM environment. So basically, once you get the light into the fiber, the only way it comes out is the other end. It does not emit and, and no light gets in uh, from anywhere but the two ends. Um, the the well-known uh, characteristic of the fiber is how much better it is than, at co than coaxial cables for um, attenuation versus unit length. These are some representative cables, uh, uh, RF cables, as a function of frequency. I'm sorry the, the numbers are so small, but this is 10 megahertz, um, 100 megahertz, a gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, and here's the attenuation in, a, in just 100 meters of the coax. Uh, in, and you can see 1 dB, 10 dB, 100 dB. Um, there are many varieties. Basically, as you get to lower and lower loss per unit length, these cables get thicker and heavier and more expensive and harder to bend. Um, that, that's all bad. <laughs> and versus uh, uh, optical fiber, here's the optical fiber attenuation versus optical wavelength and the corresponding optical frequencies. Near 200 terahertz, which is about 1,500 nanometers, um, the attenuation in 100 meters is well under 0.1 dB in 100 meters, not per meter, but, but in that entire 100 meters. It's about, in fact, 0.03 dB. Um, uh, the bandwidth, as you can see, uh, is tens of, tens of terahertz or tens of thousands of gigahertz over, uh, over which the, the, the uh, loss is minimized. It's particularly in this dry fiber where they've removed these uh, 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 hydrogen ion um, uh, uh, peaks of absorption. So this is a, a terrific advantage for antenna remoting. Well, what do I mean by antenna remoting and an analog photonic link at all? Most photonics people are digital photonics people. Almost all of the, the photonic um, uh, advancements and component advancements in the past 20 years or past 30 or 40 years really now have been uh, for the purposes of sending digital signals over fiber for the internet and other and other uh, applications and this is what how that would look you know you have a baseband signal um, uh, basically a digital signal stretches all the way down to baseband um, 
you allow that signal to modulate light. And I show a modulator as if it is a mixer because that is exactly what it is. You're mixing um, your, your RF signal um, frequencies with an optical frequency to produce this uh, double sideband uh, modulation of the optical carrier at the frequency F sub opt here. And you propagate through your medium, in this case, usually fiber. And at the photo detector, I show a mixer with just one input. The photo, at the, the photo detector is also a mixer. You're mixing all of this with, with, an, with, a, with itself, basically squaring it. Um, and that causes some indifference frequencies to happen. And the main, frequent, the main output, therefore, is at the differences between this strong carrier and the two sidebands. So what comes out is predominantly just that, that original uh, baseband modulation that went in. So that works very well. That's a digital link. What about an analog link? It's the same thing. It's just usually the baseband information, which is often uh, still digitized, um, or it could be a voice, what have you, um, is put on an RF carrier before all that same stuff happens. So now this is what the spectrum looks like optically in the pop propagation medium. You've got your optical carrier, and to either side, you have your single RF carrier on which, on which you've, you've got your uh, 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 baseband modulation. Now, um, that's digital in, digital out still, or baseband in, baseband out. We still want to retrieve, in an in a antenna remoting link, we still want to retrieve the information that's on the RF carrier that the antenna picks up. But we don't need all this stuff out here. We basically just need to connect the modulator directly to the antenna because what comes in at the antenna, it's already got all that. It's, it's the RF carrier with its, with its modulation sideband. Um, you notice I draw this without an amplifier before the modulator. It's often possible to put an amplifier before the modulator, except when you've got that, those problems I mentioned where there's a strong interferer, you'll, you'll saturate the amp. Uh, so you don't want that. Or if you're in an environment uh, where the, the amp, which has, you know, a PN junction in it, uh, will burn out because of a high power uh, interferer. Th this type of modulator that I show here, will, that will not happen. Um, so I, I'll get to that some more in a bit. Uh, so back to our main diagram here. What, what happens when you employ photonic remoting? Well, now all these necessary pieces that I talked about or desirable pieces um, between the antenna and the receiver, all of that can be remoted. That's, that's the purpose of the analog photonic link. All I need at the antenna is that modulator. I can remote the optical source, which is usually a laser, the source of the optical carrier, and I can remote the photo detector and everything that comes after it. And it's still, you know, now, now this very broadband information um, that's on a these RF carriers carrying their um, uh, double sideband modulation, all of that gets double sideband modulated on the optical carrier. It looks very complicated, but what comes out is still the simple copy of what went in. And, it, and it, it, what's important, if I forget to mention it later, is the analog photonic link is basically an RF in, RF out component in which in between you've happened to be doing this up and down conversion to and from the optical frequencies. So that's how RF people like myself think about that. And, and therefore, all the figures of merit for this box, this antenna, foot, this antenna remoting and analog photonic link are the same figures of merit you'd use to uh, characterize any RF component or subsystem. So that's analog photonic links for antenna remoting. What else can analog photonics do for us? Well, I've talked about the antenna remoting. That's the obvious benefit. The less obvious applications are basically to try to, to replace each of those five boxes I talked about, starting with the suppressing of strong interferers and going through the, the uh, time delay control and so forth, channelization, down conversion, and digitization. There's photonics um, benefits. There's benefits of doing each of these photonically. Um, in some cases, those benefits don't yet maybe outweigh things like cost, but we're getting there. Uh, so I'm going to touch on um, each of the some of the ways this can be done, starting with suppression of high power interferers. This to to understand how we've done that, it's a little bit um, necessary. It's necessary to go a little bit first into uh, the workings of that key component at the front of the link, the modulator. Uh, again, the, the laser is just operated CW to generate the optical. 
what's really important is how the modulator works. And the most, uh, the prevalent modulator in our field and even in the digital field, uh, digital photonics field is something called a Max Zender interferometric modulator. The, the, um, what I'm showing in blue here are optical waveguides. An optical waveguide at the input gets split into two arms and then recombines to uh, form an interferometer. Um, what, what you then do is cause the uh, voltage, which is you know the signal voltage, to uh, to interact with the field, the optical field in in one or more of the waveguides, one or both of the waveguides, and the what what voltage does on those these electrodes that I show near the waveguides or above the waveguides um, is it, it, as the electric field that's generated goes through the optical waveguide, it changes the index of refraction of the of the optical medium, and therefore changes the optical phase before in one arm. Uh, relative to the other arm before you recombine. And that causes a change in the degree of constructive versus deconstructive interference. So, um, and that's how, so, so when you start with no phase difference in the two arms, all the light that goes in comes, comes out constructively interfering and comes out. But uh, if you put on a big enough signal to cause one arm to be delayed in optical phase by 180 degrees relative to the other, then you get destructive interference and you've turned the light all the way off. So what a modulator does is you bias with a DC voltage about halfway between those two points and allow the uh, RF signal to, um, you know, to move you around that quiescent point and uh, so the so you are modulating the degree of constructive versus destructive interference at the same rate as your as your RF signal, uh, and so you've got modulated light that has that spectral characteristics that, that I've been showing with this, the double sideband modulation, and at the photo detector you convert it back. So um, the reason this can do interference cancellation is you can arrange things this way. You you you've got your antenna connected to just one of the to an electrode that's over just one of the two arms of the interferometer. And that's picking up both the signal you want and the signal you don't want, which may be much stronger, as I indicate with the thicker arrow here. Um, but if you have, if that's, if that signal you don't want to modulate the light here is one for which you have a reference copy because it's being fed to another antenna, maybe further down the ship, you take a copy of that and you allow it and only it to modulate to, you know, to be fed to this other arm of the max sender so that, you know, and that is not going to get any of the received signal of interest. So you've got common mode on both of these arms for the signal you don't want and a differential mode for the, for the signal you do want. And it's a differential device, basically this, this interferometry goes as the cosine of the difference between the two phases and the two arms. Uh, and the cosine is taken after the, you take the difference. So this can be a very strong signal on both arms if it, ex if it is exactly the same in strong magnitude and in phase, it subtracts to zero before you take the, before you take this, uh, the, the cosine. And really you're operating at this halfway point, um, uh, halfway up the curve. So it's one plus cosine of, a, of something small, which is really the sign of that small thing. Uh, so you end up with something very proportional to the RF signal. But that's, this works particularly well. Um, the other thing you can do is what, sometimes you, the signal you are uh, trying to subtract is the signal that you're trying to transmit from that very same antenna. This is not done by a lot of people, but some people do try to use an antenna for simultaneous transmit and receive from that one same antenna. To do this requires usually what's called a circulator, as many of you know. Um, uh, you have a bi-directional port to which you're uh, uh, through, yeah, to which you're trying to feed one signal, and from which you're trying to receive, retrieve another signal. You need something called a circulator three-port device. We simulate that. We don't call it a circulator because it's it's not quite the same in that you can't permutate the ports here. Uh, the the light will only go in the one direction here. So. Uh, if you put the connect the antenna to this bi-directional port, I can now 
uh, send RF signals to that across my electrodes, not without converting it to light, but the receive signal will get converted to light uh, and arrive at this photo detector. And the transmit signal, besides being in common mode here, and therefore, you know, you're taking the difference and subtracting um, uh, because of the interferometry. The other way that you get suppression in this case is it's, it's the transmit signal is going in the direction opposite to the light. So it just does not get modulated. The light does not get modulated uh, efficiently, and that's what you want to suppress it. So uh, I, I keep mentioning that this works very well. This is a this is a measurement of how well it works. Uh, this um, I, I think I use the uh, 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 um, abbreviation TIPRX here. T I P R X. It's uh, transmit isolating photonic receiver. Um, this suppresses the transmit signal at the receiver by this many dB. Uh, the port one to three isolation, which is usually what a, what a circulator will call the S31. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I gotta, didn't mean to click that. Uh, the S31 of, of many COT circulators shown by this symbol is here. I plot the, these on this same plot. This, this is just from a data sheet. But the uh, meanwhile, what we've measured on our network analyzer for our TIPRIX is this port one to three isolation. And this has been normalized to any loss. So it's not that the link is just lossy. It's no, this, this, um, the receive signals coming through it with zero dB loss. And this is what's happening to the transmit signal. It's being suppressed by 40 dB across more than three decades of bandwidth compared to about 20 dB for the best of these circulators over maybe an octave of bandwidth. So that's, uh, like I mentioned, photonics has this great bandwidth advantage. And why is that? Well, really what you're doing is uh, just like in a radio, you're where, you know, you're not transmitting at baseband, you're putting your broadband baseband information up on some RF carrier where that, where that, what was a broad, what you could have considered a broadband down at baseband is now a tiny fractional bandwidth to the RF, relative to the RF carrier. Well, we're doing that again. We're taking all of that and modulating this 200,000 gigahertz carrier, the light, the optical carrier. And now all our RF information is very narrow band uh, from, a, from the perspective of that carrier. And so that's why we end up with very broadband performance of the type I showed on the last slide. And this slide just lists, um, and I've got one of these for each of the technologies I, I just listed. Um, lists a lot of the uh, main movers in this area, the, the area of trying to do get better uh, transmit receive isolation and interference cancellation. These is, this is everybody besides my company, Photonic Systems, who should be on all of these lists, but uh, I, wanted, meant, I want to acknowledge who else is working in these fields. So, um, so that was a couple examples of interference signals. Um, it's also possible, like I mentioned, to control amplitude phase or delay. Uh, controlling amplitude, I'm not going to show a picture of. That's as easy as just turning up or down the laser power. The, the signal power out of the photo detector is obviously proportional actually to the square of the strength of that, of that um, optical carrier, like I talked about earlier, where you're mixing it with itself. Um, uh, so that's not very interesting, but controlling the RF phase, there's interesting ways to do that. And then controlling the RF delay, there's many ways to do that. And, and it's very advantageous to do that in fiber. Controlling the RF phase, uh, the, sig the phase of an RF signal that's modulating the light <clears throat> is somewhat um, in involved, but you can do it, uh, as we show here, in a method that's very similar to what's employed in vector modulators. Basically, you separate it into I and Q and, and then control the amplitude of the I versus the Q before you, you add it back together. So in other words, um, if I uh, take my RF signal and uh, generate a, a in phase and a quadrature um, uh, piece of that signal and allow each to modulate its own optical carrier, then if I play with the amplitude of one carrier versus the other, I'm playing with how much um, how much I'm moving in the X dimension here versus the Y, and therefore I, the vector that comes out, I can, I can move from anywhere between zero and 360 degrees uh, very easily. 
So this is uh, work from people in Australia. I tend to show these very old <laughs> uh, papers. I, I like to cite sort of the first work in each case, uh, in each of these cases. So this is from a very old paper, June 1997. And since then, lots of other people have joined that uh, uh, set of efforts trying to do good vector modulation or just phase control. Um, true time delay is something, uh, an, an area where uh, RF photonics made a, quite a big splash in the 1990s. Most, most arrays don't need, most phase arrays, you don't need true time delay to do the steering. You can get away with just doing RF phase shift like I showed on the previous slide. So there's not a lot of work going on in this, but it, it is an interesting thing one can do in fiber very readily or in, or in um, uh, using photonics technology very readily. Here's a sort of notional diagram of what you, of, of a very straightforward means of doing uh, many bits of time delay. You know, uh, at, at each of these switches, you choose between minimum delay or some something larger, and then minimum delay or twice that large, four times that large, and so forth, uh, so that you get many bits of delay control. So this is the most conceptually straightforward way to do it, and certain time delay units uh, have that you, one can buy uh, um, involve doing this. But you're always um, it, it's, it's it's an interesting um, uh, quirk of, of photonics technology that uh, there seems to be sort of this this unbreakable trade off uh, the trade off you can't get around between. Um, you can you can have one or the other. You can either have high speed or you can have uh, low loss, and you can't have both. Um, uh, so uh, fast switches. If I, if I need to be able to switch very quickly, um, I end up with about two and a half dB of loss per switch, and that can really add up, as you can see. Whereas there are mechanical optical switches with very very low loss, and thermal optical switches with very very low loss, but but those are both slow. It's hard to even get a millisecond of, uh, of switch time. That's, a, that's considered a fast thermal optic or mechanical optical switch. So there's that trade-off that's tough. So a lot of tr work in tr fiber optic true time delay uh, has been involved in trying to get around the need for these switches. And I'm gonna show what I think is a, one of the cleverest uh, uh, things I've seen in, in, um, in this field. Uh, these researchers back in the early 1990s uh, from NRL uh, realize that if we can tune the wavelength of the laser and have the path, this is a, this is a transmitting uh, uh, um, uh, phased array. Um, it's just a little easier to show in, uh, than, the, than the receiving one, but there's a receive architecture that works just like this. If I, play, if I um, engineer the paths between where I split the modulated light into my uh, many paths. I don't know why they chose seven for this demonstration, but there's seven antennas here. Um, they, they engineered the paths such that they were made of different combinations of length of uh, regular optical fiber, which is, has very low dispersion, versus optical fiber that was engineered to have very high dispersion. Why is there such fiber? That's a good aside. Um, most, uh, most early uses of fiber were to go very, very long distances. And what the researchers found is they could go even further if they could just get around the dispersion that, that ultimately did add up. I mean, even what I call non-dispersive fiber has enough dispersion that maybe you can uh, send a one gigahertz signal 10 kilometers, but after that, the dispersion is going to start spreading your pulse, spreading your um, uh, spectral information in such a way you can't recover it with high fidelity. So they invented high dispersion fiber with the opposite slope to the um, speed of light versus uh, frequency so that if you follow your 10 kilometers of fiber of, of low dispersion fiber with maybe just a, a few hundred meters of the high dispersion fiber, you cancel out those, those two effects and you can keep going. You can, you can then put another 10 kilometers of the non-dispersive, another 100 meters of the dispersive and so forth and so forth. So, so these researchers realized, let's use you know just tens of meters, hundreds of meters of this stuff to create this prism basically. 
uh, where now as I change the wavelength of light, I'm changing the relative delay in each of these paths because um, you know, and uh, the the amount of delay is determined by the wavelength and differently in each of the paths. Uh, one could even, instead of a tunable wavelength laser, you could just uh, multiplex together many wavelengths of light and form multiple beams simultaneously. This was really clever work, um, particularly since at the time there had there weren't any commercial wavelength tunable lasers. They had to make one of these as well in order, to, in order to get this working. And they got great performance from it. It was very interesting. Lots of people, like I said, started working on uh, uh, ways of controlling delay in fiber optic links. It's, it's a fun thing to do. It's an advantageous thing to do because uh, when you change the delay in, in a photonic link, you're changing the, that delay equally across all your RF uh, modulation frequencies again because that's such a tiny percentage bandwidth of the optical carrier. So that's that's a excuse me, Dr. Ackerman. Yes, excuse me, Dr. Ackerman. So yes, I was thinking it might be a good uh, time um, to take some intermediate questions or you know interim questions here. Do, do you mind doing that? Not at all. Okay, so um, one of the uh, I think curiosities of the uh, attendees is. Um, around the um, dynamic range of a photonic link. And yes. you know, for example, in a receive pad, also just that question maybe in general. And then um, when you're going electrical to optical and optical to electrical conversion, um, what in a receive path, you know, what would be the noise figure penalty mm -hmm. um, for doing that? Right. Right. Okay. Well, um, so I was starting with 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 um, why you might ever want to use photonics, but I think I've given enough examples of that, and so I've given the more ex more interesting ones. These these last remaining ones are less interesting. I'll only return to those if there's time. Let me skip ahead to sort of the second set of sli slides um, where, okay, yeah, we've covered all these ways of, we might do all this stuff photonically, but uh, now this next point I make on this slide moves into the need to answer the very question you just asked, which is what about the performance? Are we limited in noise figure and why? Are we limited in dynamic range and why? And how do we improve on that? And so I've got lots of slides on just those questions and they start right around here. So- Okay, um, um, well, yes. well, let me, but let me throw in then a couple of things that maybe go back to what you were covering mm -hmm. there. Cause it sounds like, yeah, you're moving, you're gonna move into that mm -hmm. uh, at the heart of maybe this uh, next section on the, the first couple of questions. So the other things that came up is um, you, you, I think you mentioned the switching time of a mechanical yes. optical switch. Is that, yes. you said that, is that milliseconds? Did you say, or it's, it's uh, a millisecond would be a very fast MEM switch, MEMS optical switch. You really, you have to move okay. a fiber quite a ways before it, it switches from all the way on to all the way off. Got it. And then um, one question um, was, um, how do you measure true time delay um, right. in, in, um, in the context here? Yeah, well, there's, there's ways you can do it. I mean, you can, if you have some system that allows you to put in a pulse and then quantify how long it takes for you to see that pulse at the other end of your, of your system, you can do it that way. But um, a, an opti a, a regular PNA or network analyzer um, usually has a button for uh, uh, doing that, that math for you. Re um, delay is the derivative of phase with respect to frequency. So um, a cable, if you were to put a pretty long cable uh, between ports one and two of your analyzer and measure phase, you'd see a slope. Can you still see me besides my slides? Um, and the, the the slope of that slope, <laughs> you'd see, you'd see, you'd see something that, you know, looks like a sawtooth yes. because it keeps having to, you know, it's, ra it's wrapping around zero to 360. It, it, um, but if you unwrapped it so that it were just a slope, you know, going from zero to thousands of degrees, the, how quickly it's doing that with frequency that the slope of that line is the delay in seconds. Um, typically in, you know, nanoseconds or microseconds or picoseconds, but um, 
that's that's how one can measure. Basically, a network analyzer. The short answer to your question is a network analyzer is well set up to allow you to measure delay because it's measuring phase of S21 and it knows the frequency at each of those phases. So it calculates the derivative for you. Um, Got it. You, you have to be smart about uh, telling, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't know not to send another pulse too soon unless you tell it, hey, I'm trying to measure something about this long. So you've got you to look up the instructions on how to do it, but it's very well set up for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, great. Yeah. So, um, uh, I'm just out of curiosity about how many more slides do you have? I, well, mean, I, I, don't, for, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't remember. How, when do you? How do you? When do you want me to try to finish by ten thirty? Um. Oh, uh, I don't think so. We um, no. we can go no. a little longer than that. Um, okay. We, yeah, I've, uh, I've got, got a good. We got 20. a little bit of a late start. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got a good twenty more slides, but I can I can go quickly through them. Well, I think uh, we've got about 50 attendees and um, everybody's sitting tight. So we, we can go a little longer. And okay. uh, um, I don't know if Jay has any comment or. Yeah, I think you're uh, three hours ahead of us, uh, Dr. Rashman. <laughs> so it'll be 30 for us. Um, right. 1030 was a little bit alarming, but don't, uh, I understand that it was a few hours. No, no, no. <laughs> <that's fine. laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, not 1030 Pacific time. Right. <laughs> so we can, sorry about we that. Can yeah. Certainly, uh, I'm sorry. We can I, go on a little bit longer. <laughs> Good point. I, I'm just now getting it. But yes, I meant 7:30. I guess. <laughs> if you want me to be done well, by 7:30, I, I, think... I can do that. No, no, no. You can go a little longer. I think. Was what, uh, Jay was okay. To... Okay. Excellent. Um, so, so yeah, the, what I've talked about up till now is why you might want to do use photonics, but it's important to know, well, wait a minute, can I use photonics and get the performance I need? And the answer to that is yes, but only if you're smart about it, only if you know what you're doing and know how to design these links to, uh, uh, to have acceptable performance. And what I mean by a link is usually just, uh, the, the set of components consisting of the source of my optical carrier and then the modulator that lets the RF uh, uh, signal uh, get mixed up onto that optical carrier and then the photo detector, which is for a straightforward remoting link is before all this stuff. But in this example, I put those photo detectors here uh, after all these other functions because um, uh, I can down convert and everything uh, photonically. Um, so uh, you want that basic link to be performing well before you add all this other functionality. And that's what the points made here. So I'm going to return to just straightforward uh, remoting links. First, I'm going to say though, uh, here's, here's, ex here's again, those two architectures that did inter um, interference cancellation versus uh, uh, simultaneous transmit and receive from the same antenna. Why, why do I have to get good performance, good noise figure without an amp? Well, if I want to do anything fancy like this, I can't have an amp. These grade out amplifiers are basically, they're, they're problematic. Uh, it's more obvious over here where the grayed out amplifier, sure, it lets through this receive signal, but I'm trying to get a transmit signal out to the antenna. I can't send it through the, the uh, amplifier uh, backwards like this. So I've got to get good noise figure for the receive link without the amp. In the case of the interference cancellation, the whole point of the interference cancellation was to not saturate any amplifiers. I want to subtract the signals from one another, the, the interfering signals from one another before they reach any sort of nonlinear component like the amp. So um, you know, I, I want the first amp to be after the photo detector in both of these cases. Well. Uh, in order to have low noise figure, you have to have high gain. And it was surprising to, to many people in the late 80s when my boss, Charlie Cox, who started photonic systems in the late 90s, um, demonstrated, uh, first hypothesized with equations and then demonstrated experimentally that, that that set of components, the laser modulator and photo detector without any RF amps, can have gain. It doesn't always have gain. If you're not, again, if you don't design it right, it won't have gain. Uh, but if, but there's nothing, there's no magical zero dB limit to uh, the gain that the link can have. It can have anything from positive infinity to negative infinity dB of gain, um, depending on how you design it. And the uh, expressions he de derived are, are shown here. And they're 
they, what he basically realized was that the outputs, the, the gain is the output signal over the input signal and the output signal uh, um, relates to the input signal through these two, these two relationships at the photo detector, the output current is proportional to the input optical power through a um, uh, uh, um, parameter called responsivity. That's this R sub D. And at the modulator, the, that same optical power, that's the horizontal axis over here, is, is the vertical axis here and is proportional to the input voltage. And then you need to get from voltage to current back to voltage, you need the output uh, uh, resistance as well to get a unitless number again. Um, so he derived the slope of the modulator transfer function, the slope of the photo detector transfer function, which like I said, is this responsivity. Uh, and you end up with this gain expression. And what you notice here, oh, and it's a function of this, this bias point, the phi is the modular bias point. Like I said, you usually, the, the, the maximum slope point happens to be halfway between maximum power and minimum power. You want the maximum slope. And that's this 90 degrees. This is 180 degrees here where you have uh, destructive interference. The voltage that shuts off the modulator is often called the V pi of the modulator. If you start working in photonics, that's a term you'll, you'll learn very fast. That's V pi there. So um, this slope uh, is, is represented by this um, set of, uh, of, of uh, parameters, and it's proportional to the sine of this um, bias angle. And the bias, so it's maximum at this 90 degree point halfway between on and off. And it's proportional to the input laser power. In other words, the, you can see where this slope would get steeper if the input laser power is bigger because it means you hit this axis higher and higher up. And that stretches out this curve and, and makes this slope greater. It's also inversely proportional to this voltage that switches you from on to off. If you can compress this curve, you also make this slope greater at the, at the bias point. Uh, and so you end up with this expression, like I said, and um, there's this, yes, there's some loss in it. This is the fiber to fiber insertion loss from the input of the laser to the output of the photo to, uh, to the uh, where you illuminate your photo detector. Um, you know, there's all these other terms, but, but he noticed that there's nothing in here that magically shuts this off when you reach zero dB. So he just kept turning up his laser power, turning up his laser power. He was operating down in the tens to hundreds of megahertz where the photo detector could be very large and could withstand a lot of optical power. And he ended up uh, not blowing up the link and not blowing up the photo detector until after he had reached more than 10 dB of RF gain for the link. And that uh, was that was a um, a real breakthrough, uh, and it led others, including myself, to start looking at other ways of getting gain. And uh, in the late '80s and early 1990s, a lot of papers you'd find on photonic links were, "Hey, what's the best modulation architecture? What how do, how how best to build a high performance link? Starting with ha having it have high gain." which will lead to low noise figure, lead to high dynamic range, which I'm going to get to. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. I was working in direct modulation and I got gain out of a direct modulation link. Charlie had been working and others were working with external modulation. In a direct modulation link, instead of having a separate modulator, you're just putting your input signal along with the DC bias that turns on your optical source and allowing the amount of photons out of the optical source to be modulated by the modulation of that, of that turn on uh, uh, of current. Um, it's not as advantageous. You end up having to use a source that in order to be fast, it's noisier. Um, so you, you end up with worse performance typically. Most links now are external modulation links, but even within direct modulation, you can directly modulate the, amp modulate the amplitude or you can modulate the optical frequency. In the external modulation case, you can modulate the amplitude and therefore the intensity, or you can modulate the, just the phase and convert to intensity or the frequency and convert to intensity. I keep saying convert to intensity because the photo detector can only see changes in intensity. It cannot see changes in optical frequency or phase. Uh, so here's the optical intensity and see if you only change the frequency or phase, 
the intensity isn't changing. The e to the j, whatever the intense, the magnitude squared of that is is unity. So you need some way to convert uh, phase or frequency modulation into intensity if you're going to do any of these. But I've color coded them because this next slide shows a progression over the years of of link gain uh, demonstrations uh, as a function of frequency and. Uh, here's the different uh, types of link that I mentioned um, on the previous slide. And you can see the highest gain link ever. Uh, and these are all without, without an amplifier and uh, input and output at the same frequency. In other words, no frequency conversion, which sometimes you do want. In this case, it was all without that. Um, and what I've left in color are the best demonstrations at any given frequency by any of the, of, for any of the given types. Uh, and just in general, you saw things were getting better and better from year to year. And that's what's been exciting about our field. Once Now that we have many demonstrations of links with greater than zero dB gain, um, you can ask, well, maybe the noise figure will be, I'm um, sorry, I should never use a trackpad. <laughs> maybe the noise figure can be made pretty good too. Without the gain being good, you're going you're gonna to necessarily have bad noise figure. But even if you have good gain, it's possible to not have good noise for you. So here's an, here's an, here is an answer to your question about, can you get good noise figure? And if so, how? The answer is yes, but it's, you have to do even more to, in your link design, be even smarter about how to do it in order to end up with low noise figure. So here's those same diagrams of what, when, uh, what goes into the gain. Well, I show, them, I show them because several of the sources of noise um, scale as the total photocurrent out, not the slope of photocurrent versus power, but the total photocurrent. So what would be nice is if we could somehow have high gain, which again, you need in order to have low noise figure. And that's because of this term. Um, uh, yeah, the output noise is proportional to the input thermal noise and the out uh, uh, plus the output thermal noise. So if you don't have high gain, then your signal shows up weaker than your out, you know, weak relative to this output thermal noise that's not attenuated by any losses in front of it. So you want high gain. Um, uh, but there's these other sources of noise. This term is the shot noise, the, the output noise due to the shot noise process of photo detection. And this term is due to the, is the fact that you're also detecting any noise that's already on the laser optical carrier. Any, you know, the, the laser puts out a, an optical carrier that you'd love to be perfectly pure spectrally. But in truth, it has some noise right near it. Well, right near it means at the microwave frequencies where you're trying to communicate. And that's what's called this relative intensity noise. It's, it's pretty frequency dependent, but, but tends to be, you tend to be about 160 dB down from the carrier. I mean, that's great, but um, you know, that, that is go it's going to be a limit to your noise figure. So you, um, here's, here's your output noise. Mostly it's, terms that are not proportional to the gain of the link. Uh, it has this one term that is proportional to the gain of the link. In other words, it's the input thermal noise times the gain. That's the, that's the term that limits you to a noise figure of no, no less than zero dB. So that's not going anywhere. But this term and these other two terms are going to be less and less significant to the noise figure um, if the gain can be high because gain is, is noise figure is signal to noise ratio degradation. So it's this big output noise term divided by the, the amplified thermal noise amplified by the, the link itself. So again, high gain means these other three terms that are not proportional to gain get less and less significant. Um, so that's good. So we want to operate somewhere where the, these slopes are high, but we'd like to not have to have such high output optical current because uh, output photo current, because these terms are proportional to either that or that squared. Um, I note that because here's the, here's the expression for that level. And now it is not proportional to the sine of the, of the phi, it's proportional to the one plus cosine. And that means um, we might do something clever called low biasing. If we, uh, it was noticed by me and two other sets of researchers in 1993 that as you start uh, moving this bias point down, yes, the signal is decreasing because the slope is decreasing, but the level is decreasing faster than the slope. 
So the signal to noise ratio actually in, in improves as you go down this, as long as you have enough optical power. And using that technique, we were able to take these very high initial noise figures and get some very much lower noise figures, initially only at very low frequencies, but lately up at higher frequencies. Like I said, 5 dB is about, is a pretty good noise figure for an amp at, uh, at the moment. Um, uh, and so this is what we specialize in at PSI, my company, getting low noise figure without a preamplifier. And if you get low, low noise figure, you can get good dynamic range. Um, uh, so dynamic range is uh, this expression where you, you know the intercept uh, power between, you know, where the hypothetical input power where your output fundamental signals and your output intermod signals are going to in, uh, intersect. Um, uh, so, so the Spurford dynamic range is a, is a portion of the ratio between that power and your output noise. So the lower the output noise, the better the dynamic range. Um, and the modulator has a pretty good input um, IP2 and input IP3. In fact, at the quadrature point where there is no um, even order, uh, where, where, the, where the even order derivative is zero, I, input IP2 is theoretically infinite. Uh, so you, you're, you're, you're uh, even in a broadband link um, operating over more than an octave, you're limited by IP3. That advantage goes away if you do the low biasing. So there, there is a trade-off there. Um, so dynamic range uh, demonstrations are shown here as a function of the passing years. And as you can see, we get dynamic ranges that rival that of amplifiers. Um, this is dB in a hertz. So there's some that are not linearized, so their dB hertz to the two thirds, and there's some that are linearized, and their dB hertz to the four fifths. I go into that on this next one. Here's here's only the ones that are broadband more than an octave, um, uh, and some of them are linearized, but I only include the ones that are linearized over more than an octave. Uh, so so you can see we again we are comparable to some of the some of the uh, uh, commercial amplifiers on the market at these frequencies. You asked about dynamic range, and like I said, I, 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 <laughs> that is something many people ask, so I have slides on that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good, good, good setup question for you. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, I should, you're not a plant, but you, you did just as well as a plant. <laughs> um, uh, linearization is something we have pursued. It's not easy to do because often, I don't know if any of you work on linearization of not just, you know, linearization of most things involves splitting your input RF signal into two paths uh, where you allow um, more nonlinearity in one path versus the other. And then you balance out the intermods and subtract and you've subtracted some signal, but hope, but hopefully not all of the signal and that results in a better dynamic range. It typically, because you've thrown away signal and noise figure is signal to noise ratio degradation, throwing away signal means worse noise figure. But even that splitting that I talked about to get the two different nonlinearities is problematic because uh, linearization, if you've ever worked on it, it's a very sensitive thing. You've got to get that balance just right to get any benefit. And splitting a, an RF signal into two paths is not something that is accurate, you know, constant with frequency uh, and you need it to be. So we did, another thing we did at Photonic Systems was invent a, photo, a linearized photonic link where you don't have to split the RF into two paths. You get a different nonlinearity in the two paths by virtue of the fact that that same one signal that I put on this electrode here generates more field interaction with the um, with the light in this max ender than in this one. These these symbols here are meant to be the the front tips and the rear tails of air of field arrows. So you know. Uh, your RF signal imposes an electric field from this electrode to this ground electrode and from this electrode to this ground electrode. And in doing so, interacts with the light in this max ender about twice as strongly as with the light in this max ender because you get push and pull on the, on the optical index here where versus just pull here. Um, that, that has resulted in nice broadband um, uh, uh, 
characteristic to the linearization. And, and the reason for that is, you know, you've, you've got the interaction is twice as strong here as here. And that ratio of, of about two factor of two or six dB uh, is very constant with frequency as shown here. Um, and we proved that with intermod measurements, the, you know, the two tone IMD measurement that has this classic appearance. Uh, by at the very same settings that where we got linearization at two gigahertz, we also got it at 10 gigahertz with the slope of five to the third order intermods that you get when you've linearized. Um, that's, you know, unless you're really into linearization, that's not something you're gonna wanna uh, talk too much about, but if I'll ask, answer questions in case you are. As I mentioned, most linearization means subtracting of, um, of signal in order to subtract the intermods down to zero, and that eats away at your uh, your gain, and therefore your noise figure gets worse. Uh, I, I published this paper sort of on a whim in in like 2015 ish, and it's really kind of taken on a life of its own. People are always sort of quoting it back to me. I had this this sort of provocative subtitle to it: first fix the noise figure. In other words, don't bother linearizing if you don't if you don't already have a good noise figure because you're going to make a noise figure that, it, that, all, that isn't very good much worse by linearizing uh, such that now you'll need an even stronger preamp and you're probably going to negate the advantage of having linearized to begin with. So um, the other thing I noticed is some of the best uh, <laughs> spur-free dynamic ranges on that dynamic range part uh, chart that I showed uh, you know, uh, populating over time are ones where we do, where there was not linearization. So, um, so I've been searching for the best architecture uh, to use to get a, a low noise figure simultaneous to high spur free dynamic range. And I've settled on, oops, this, wow, cannot control this today. I've settled on this architecture, which was one, again, from my past here, uh, it pays to keep track of things. Um, a gentleman by the name of Bill Burns who worked at Photonic Systems after being at NRL, uh, uh, but who has uh, passed on now. He's, he would have been about in his late 80s, I think, by now. Um, he invented this architecture with his co-authors here um, that involved using what's called an unbalanced Max Ender so that uh, you know, the, the path between the two lengths of the two, the arms are, are, are of different lengths. So different wavelengths of light are, um, are at different points on the modulator transfer function at any given bias voltage. And if you operate where these overlap and make that engineer the overlap and the wavelength difference such that you're at a low bias for both of the wavelengths, but, but opposite slopes, in a balanced photo detector, when you subtract, you're subtracting positive slope, you're subtracting negative slope from positive slope and therefore getting basically twice the positive slope. So you get signal addition, but meanwhile, the even order distortion products are of the same sign. So you subtract those and you're getting, you're back to therefore being limited by the third order distortion, which is what you want. And yet you can get very low noise figure. He shows about five dB here. This is only a model, um, but uh, uh, we are we are working to um, validate this model right now. I think this is a very promising architecture that he invented 25 years ago that just hasn't been really brought to fruition yet. So that's what I'm working on. This is my, this is my last slide. I didn't have 20 more slides, um, but uh, this. This is my last slide on the technology. I have a few slides where I'm pitching the IEEE membership to your to my audience as well. But this is this summarizes what I've talked about. There's lots of interesting applications of analog photonic links, and therefore it's very challenging and interesting work. And that's something I like to tell my audience when my especially when my audience is young. Uh, I'm trying to encourage more people to go into this field. I think it's uh, like I said, very rewarding to work in, and we need more um, U.S. people to to work on this field. Uh, uh, the, it started taking off in the 80s and 90s, and then the number of researchers hasn't grown as the field has grown, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I'm hoping to remedy that and get generate excitement in it. 
Um, we need uh, better devices to get better uh, link performance, and those are coming. I'm working with lots of uh, new groups, including a group at Harvard University that never used to make devices, but now does make some of the best modulators in the world. Um, uh, low, low noise lasers are needed, and, the, and those are being developed at all sorts of uh, places, including many universities in the US. And uh, I'm really glad to see all these things. And like I said, there's there's just so much to do, and and it's it's very fun working on it. Um, my my field has its own my little niche field has its own um, conference, the Microwave Photonics Conference (MWP), the uh, International Topical Meeting on Microwave Photonics is what is its full name. It's uh, occur has occurred every year since 1996. This year, it's going to be mostly virtual, if not entirely virtual, because of COVID, of course. But this year, it's uh, being hosted by uh, colleagues of mine in Japan. This is everywhere it's been um, since it started in 1996. And I use this as an example of why I am such a fan of the IEEE, because my boss and my thesis advisor, who were two of the pioneers, those two men who were two of the pioneers in my field, decided this field needed its own conference. We were sort of the poor men at, at uh, the poor people at IMS and at other conferences like that. We had a little session here, a little session there. We decided, no, we need, we need everyone in the world working on this to get together once a year. And it's, that, that's usually about 200 people, but we move it around uh, so that everyone gets their shot at having it nearby. And so it goes from the Americas one year to Asia Pacific another year, to Europe another year and so forth. So this year it's in uh, Matsui, Japan. Next year it's gonna be in Pisa, Italy, and then it'll be in the States after that or Canada. Um, it, and like I said, uh, we, the, we needed the conference and the IEEE obliged. It's an MTT uh, sponsored and Photonic Society sponsored conference. So I, I encourage all of you to, to remain active in the IEEE. The benefits are, are, are numerous. And uh, you saw the papers I quoted. Um, I, I'd be lost without my uh, IEEE Explore um, digital library. Uh, um, use it every day, multiple times. So anyway, that's kind of a disjointed um, pitch for staying <laughs> at IEEE, but, but those are my two cents. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, you know, this is Tom McKay. I, I totally agree with you um, uh, on the benefits of IEEE. And then, uh, yeah, uh, there's the big conferences, and then there's these, uh, these special conferences that, uh, uh, and it's interesting to hear about this one. I, I know uh, I, I'm not involved in, in, in photonics. Um, I work at Global Foundries, however, and we, we do have a, oh. um, a, silicon, a silicon photonics. Uh, technology and yes. uh, and roadmap. I I I was gonna maybe let's ask a few questions that came up uh, while you were while you were going there, um, mm -hmm. and then I, I maybe I'll maybe include somehow somehow a question about integrated photonics, uh, how you see that playing out. But um, one question came as um, you know these optical amplifier, I guess sort of electrical amplifier less systems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you know, what kind of maximum input power uh, can you can you take of mm -hmm. RF input power? Yeah, that's good. And I, I happened to stop at this slide just as I was trying to say, oh, oh yes. Um, uh, the the first you mentioned silicon photonics. I want to go address that a little bit. Um, the best modulators, and it's really the, mo the the detectors perform very well. If a link performs really well, it's because that well-performing detector was paired up with a very good performing modulator. The modulators are sort of the tall pole in the tent in terms of getting the link to work better. And the very best performing modulators in the world have traditionally been, been the ones in um, made in the lithium nibate material, uh, mostly because the loss of the optical waveguide in that material is so low that there's no penalty to, for making the device very long and therefore having a, a very long interaction of the of the modulating signal with the light and therefore efficient modulation of the light in sil but then silicon photonic modulators came along recently with the hope that everything can be made much more inexpensively and you one can um, integrate the modulator with other 
components that the modulator is working with. For instance, in this setup, the RF splitter could be in silicon, the power amplifier could be in silicon, or in a or in a material that it can be, I don't even know the lingo, can be integrated with the silicon, can be realized on the silicon. You can tell I, I don't, I'm not a fab guy. <laughs> um, but, but silicon photonics was largely motivated by trying to make things less expensive and smaller. Um, in order uh, uh, through integration and more reliable, lots of lots of all the benefits of integration. You don't get the nth degree of performance if you leave the lithium nibate material uh, uh, for silicon, but that's not always the most important thing. Um, so, th so that was your first question. The other question about power handling. Um, here's I happened to stop on on a on a slide where the power handling of the the ability to to withstand high input powers is important. Um, there's there's what you can withstand and survive and not not die, and then there's what you can um, process well and still be linear. Um, those are two separate questions about how much power you can uh, operate at. Um, so modulators, as you lower the VPI, the, uh, like I said, the gain goes up, the noise figure goes down, but the IP3 goes down also. Um, you know, the, as you become more sensitive, you're gonna reach, that's good from a gain and noise figure standpoint. It's bad from an IP3 standpoint, you're gonna reach the, the power at which nonlinearity happens faster. But that proportionality is equal, so it ends up a wash. You you your best noise figure comes with better VPI, so you make the VPI lower. Um, the IP3 goes down with the noise figure, but the dynamic range stays good. Um, uh, so for a low noise figure link, one that you've designed to have low noise figure without a preamp, typically you're you're hitting your one dB compression somewhere between an input power of zero and plus 10 dBm for an IP3 of plus 10 to plus 20 dBm. You know, you don't operate up near the IP3. Um, but the modulator meanwhile can withstand watts of power at plus 30, plus 40 dBm without damage. So, so you can do things like this, uh, arrange to just subtract the large signals. Um, so that they don't modulate the light. And the fact that they're large doesn't also does not damage the device. The dimensions here are such that this can withstand quite a bit of RF power. I, I think I follow. So um, um, there, there's two other questions. One is um, uh, maybe this is a little bit easier uh, is uh, do you see a role for um, analog photonics linear photonics in 5G infrastructure? That's a great question. I get asked that a lot and I'm not very qualified to answer other than to say, um, you know, I, when people think 5G, I think they're thinking of their phones and other wireless devices, but obviously there's still base stations. There are still, um, there's still a central station, um, things that need to be linked together uh, uh, where signals need to move around, not wirelessly. Um, that can happen in fiber, um, uh, you know, from, from the, you know, getting, getting from the top of the tower down uh, and, and, uh, and from the station at the bottom of the tower to the top of the tower, that can involve photonics, but that's not the high volume option. That's not the high vol volume opportunity, I should say. The opportunity would be if the, if the photonics were in the phones and in the other uh, wireless devices. Um, that can happen, but it's related to your integration question, I think, your silicon photonics question. There may be other ways to integrate other than in silicon. My friends at Harvard are working on, on integration of silicon, silicon uh, electronic components onto the same substrate that that on which they've deposited lithium nibate modulators so so if you can either that way or purely in silicon or purely in some other semiconductor uh quart, quaternary uh material maybe 
if you can integrate an entire system that exploits the photonics never going into fiber at all, just, just using the photonics for processing in some of the ways I've told, shown you, the, then you might have an integrated optical circuit inside devices like phones, you know, a PIC, a photonic integrated circuit. The, uh, the, um, um, hardware that right now has lots of RF integrated circuits may someday have photonic integrated circuits. Right, so a little bit of a vague answer so, so, because I'm not really qualified <laughs> to go further. <laughs> right. Um, but well, thank you for that though. Uh, it's interesting, interesting uh, comments there. So another question came is, um, have you, uh, you know, gallium nitride technology is, is becoming more available yes. and prevalent. Yes. And uh, ha has that affected um, any of your system design considerations, um, um, either yeah, in the signal right. path or in the modulator driver path? I'm not, I'm not sure. Right, only in so far as when we when we were looking into okay would we would we make would we try to make modulators for our high performance links in silicon well if we're considering silicon if we're considering things other than lithium nibate why why only consider silicon why not consider other semiconductors and we considered gallium nitride largely because of again i'm on the right slide for that because of power amplifiers um, the best uh, power amplifiers I know of um, are are made in that material system, gallium nitride. Um, so, uh, and we're as someone mentioned, we're right down the road from a Raytheon here that um, where there's a lot of gallium nitride experts. So, so we talk about gallium nitride a fair bit. I have to say we have not yet implemented anything in gallium nitride, but that may happen soon. Great. Okay, well, um, I think that's all the questions. Um, I wanted to um, say thank you on behalf of the Santa Clara, San Francisco uh, MTT chapter. Um, Dr. Ackerman is really informative and I, I personally um, I feel a lot more enlightened about this whole field. And um, yeah, I really appreciated your um, very approachable style here. And uh, it's uh, so I'd like to thank you very much. You're welcome, Tom. Very nice. To, uh, thank you for arranging this, uh, organizing it. I know we had to go through quite a bit to move the time, move the uh, dates around and, and do all sorts of things. But you guys, you and Jay were really easy to work with. And uh, um, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm sure there were other individuals I should be thanking and I'm, I'm, I'm lose, I've lost my list here, but <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> well, you're, you're very welcome. All right, uh, Jay, I'm not going to say a word or two, but uh, looks like yeah, I just want to jump in and say uh, again, um, just duplicating what uh, Tom said, we appreciate uh, your coming on, and it's certainly been educational. And uh, it's an honor to have you uh, do this presentation, Dr. Ackerman, and uh, um, I appreciate you supporting the uh, the Santa Clara Valley chapter and. Uh, your efforts in getting people to uh, join the IEEE. That's definitely what we need. Oh, my pleasure. And with that, I think okay. we're uh, at the end of our presentation. So Tom, did we have anything else? Or I think that's pretty much it. No, right? I think that's it for me. Yeah, I think we got pretty much got all the questions. Hey guys, so uh, Utkash here. I just made it into the meeting. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah. Good oh, job, just in time uh, for me to thank you. Just in time for me to thank Utkarsh because I know he helped, <laughs> helped organize this too. You're very welcome, uh, Dr. Ackerman. And thank you again uh, for agreeing to this talk. I missed most of it, but I'll definitely look at the recording. I'm, uh, I've been actually wanting to attend uh, uh, Silicon Photonics. Uh, I'm interested in the field and I really wanted to get going. And I think this will be a good Well, we'll be careful. <laughs> yeah, be careful. We're talking, we're talking analog. We're talking analog to photonics. I am. And, um, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. And uh, and um, yeah. So um, Dr. Ackerman was commenting that you know lithium niobate modulators are um, are are uh, quite good, and 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 that's 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 where a lot of, you know what what's what was fascinating, uh, of course, is uh, is that you know you could get the you know, idea of getting gains for an optical system, and then where it really shines, and the fact that um, 
it seems like there's a lot more there's a lot of room for innovation when it really is uh, you yep. yeah uh, and it could be some combination of um, you know the high performance lithium nile bay combined with other right. you know photonic processing uh, activities and integrated photonics right right that could uh, marry together somehow I mean we see that all the time right with you know, you have uh, electrical transceivers and then big power amplifiers with front end modules, you know, and they're in disparate technologies, but they um, they both have their place. So, yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I'm kind know. of interested in photonics in general. So I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, this would be a good place to start. So I, I also right. just wanted to mention everybody uh, that so this will be our last talk for the year. There's no talk scheduled next year. I think we had a great year in terms of attendance. I mean, uh, I know it's been difficult for everybody with the COVID situation, but that's uh, it actually spurred us to do these talks online and we've been able to build up a very good uh, 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 audience, uh, not just uh, in the Bay Area, but also in the US and also internationally, we have people attending from many countries across the world. Uh, we did record this talk, we'll be putting it up on the NTTS uh, Facebook channel. It wasn't live streamed there today, but we'll be putting up the recording and our next talk will be in January, January 20th. We have already lined up a speaker, uh, also a great speaker, and we'll be uh, publicizing the details of that event uh, uh, shortly. So yeah, I just wanted to thank the speaker again and uh, everyone that attended. So thank you. Hey, hey, Akars, congratulations on an excellent uh, year. Of, uh, oh, to all of us, I think you all uh, did a uh, yeah. job I mean, we were not sure at the beginning how to handle all the logistics, but I think uh, we all kind of uh, came together and uh, I think we've done uh, very well this year. And I hope we have a, a equally good, if not better, year next year. <laughs> okay, guys. That. All right. Thanks again, Dr. Ackerman. You're very welcome. Nice to meet you all. Bye for now.